All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the 12th episode of the Pocket Now podcast. We were just saying how we are now a preteen podcast. You know, if you're 12 years old, you're a preteen. And so we must have a curfew. I don't know what that means. That actually makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, I'm Brandon Miniman, editor-in-chief of PocketNow.com. And on the line, we've got a special guest, Dan Webster. Say hi, Dan. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. And you might know Dan Webster from many reviews on Pocket Now. He also does the Windows Phone 7 App Showcase and the Android App Weekly. Every week he does, does these videos where he goes through a variety of applications. He covers them in, uh, in 30 seconds each. So it's a very quick, dirty way to get, you know, some, some sort of, uh, I guess, recommendations on apps that you might want to download for your Windows Phone 7 or your Android device. So check that out if you haven't yet. They're really interesting, and um, they, I love watching them because I'm always looking for new apps to, uh, to download. So we're going to do a sh- little bit of a shorter show this week, probably 45 minutes instead of the full hour. It's Easter Sunday, um, so we probably want to Go on an Easter egg hunt, or are you are you going on an Easter egg hunt, Dan? Uh, no, I actually have to work. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, uh, it's been an interesting weekend. Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, will there be eggs at work? Uh, I doubt it, but uh, someone destroyed one of our bathrooms. <laughs> oh no! Oh. So, anyways, how is that echo? Y- yeah. Um. Uh. So I've been testing the echo, or trying to use it as my daily driver. It's as I'm probably going to conclude in the final review, whenever that happens to be written, it's a really good concept to have two screens on a smartphone, but the use case scenarios are very limited. That's the problem number one. Problem number two is that Kyocera is making this thing. It's ugly, the hardware isn't great, and it's backed by a name that hasn't done really a smartphone before. Um, To the first point, when would you want to look at your email while browsing a web page on your smartphone? I haven't run into one situation yet. When would you want to look at Google Maps on one screen and something else on another screen? It's just the use case scenarios aren't there. Uh, Can you think of any instances, Dan, when you thought to yourself, wow, if I had two screens on the smartphone, my life would be a lot better? Mm, Probably not. The only purpose that I could see the alternate screen being used for is a keyboard. And if you're that inclined to have a keyboard, you might as well have a you know, a physical keyboard on a device. Uh, it seems kind of weird to have two screens. I mean, if you're going to watch a video, you have that, you know, you don't black bar in the center between right. the bezels. So, I don't know. It doesn't make much sense to me. I mean, it may appeal to some others, but uh, yeah, it seems it, kind of like a, a gimmick at this point. It, it is a gimmick, and I think Kyocera thought, you know, how can we how can we make headlines in making our, our first smartphone? And they did it. But as you imply, the, the black bar between the two screens, you know, maybe in two years when we could, you know, pack a dual-core processor into this thing with better hardware, uh, even higher resolution displays, and software that is even more optimized for dual screens, uh, then we could have a really compelling solution. But right now the technology's not ready. The world's not ready for a dual-screen smartphone. Yeah, if they had like a AMOLED or something that was flexible and you could fold it out and it'd be flat, that would be okay. Ooh. But still, I mean, you have a 4-3 aspect ratio between the two and there's really nothing out there nowadays that uses a 4-3 aspect ratio. I mean, everything's in HD 16.9. So, I mean, it doesn't make sense to have a screen like that. Yeah. I, I guess, you know, it's kind of cool when you flip out the two screens and you look at, like, Twitter or Facebook, you get 960 by 800 resolution, which is sort of cool. But uh, I don't know if it's that that much of a better experience than if you were just to use one screen, you know. Yeah. Other than the screen, I mean, how is the other hardware? I mean, it is Cosierra, so is it just not that great or is it fast? And how would you, how would you rate that? Well... <laughs> It's, it's a little bit slow. It definitely needs a dual-core processor to keep up. It needs a little bit more RAM. It's ugly as sin. It's just, it's thick. It looks like a prototype. It really does. And it probably is very close to the prototype, what it looked like. Um, so it's, it's got a lot of problems in, it, in that respect. It works a little better than I thought it would, actually. I mean, 
the way you bring up the two different applications is you press two fingers or one finger on one screen, one finger on the other screen at the same time, which also happens to kill multi-touch. You can't use multi-touch in these applications that can run in parallel. So <laughs> kind of a kind of a pain there to to have to resort to double tapping to zoom in. It feels like it's you know two thousand four or something. Oh, that's weird. How's the battery since it has those, you know, two screens? I mean, is it worth it? I mean, I saw that there were only six, uh, 13, what was it, 1390, something like that. Yeah, 13, 1370. The battery life is tolerable if you leave automatic screen brightness on. And when you do that, uh, the displays become very dim. So if you turn off automatic screen brightness, you'll go down about 2% every minute, sometimes 3%. It's kind of ridiculous. Wow, that's fast. <laughs> That is true. So we'll have the full review coming up soon uh, on Pocket Now, the Kyocera Echo with performance benchmarks, uh, more remarks on battery life, and what it's like to live with a dual screen phone really as a daily driver. So let's pop on to the next thing. Uh, on April 18th, there was a sort of uh, piece of news talking about Samsung launching a 2 gigahertz dual core smartphone for 2012. Um, and you know, we heard that the Galaxy S2 and the HTC Sensation are going to ship with 1.2 gigahertz dual core processors, which seem really fast. I mean, think about when your desktop computer had uh, 1.2 gigahertz dual core. Do you remember? Do you remember when that was, Dan? Uh, I think that was like '97, perhaps. <laughs> A long, long time ago. But but the thing is, is that like processors, even though they kind of maxed out at like four giga giga hurts because of the you know silicon technology it can only you know do so much right so it, it i mean when will the phones stop having super fast speeds mm. i mean even just a couple of years ago we had like what 400 megabyte or megahertz processors and yeah the 400 <laughs> were around for a while i, I yeah. mean eventually i think this sort of happened with Laptops, especially, you run into power consumption issues. So it's better to have more cores clocking at a lower, lower, um, you know, frequency than to have le- fewer cores clocking at a higher frequency. Exactly. But then we talk about this all the time on the podcast about we're seeing an arms race really for processor speed on smartphones. I mean, all of a sudden we're seeing dual core processors, and you know, one gigahertz wasn't enough. We're going to one point two and two gigahertz next year. What are we using this power for? I check my email on my phone. I look at a YouTube video. Um, Android isn't built for multiple cores. Uh, can you think of any situation that would benefit from having multiple cores, besides gaming, of course? The only thing that I could see it benefiting is if you're going to record like full HD or playback full HD, but the displays are going to you know, make it smaller anyway, so there wouldn't really be a, ne- you know, a necessity to have a two gigahertz processor with dual cores um, unless you're going to be recording those those high resolution videos that's right. the the only thing that I could you know deem Worthy. reasonable to have such a yeah yeah and even even in the case of a QHD screen like on the sensation so you have 960 by 540 it can record 1080p but it can't it doesn't have enough pixels on the screen to play it back Exactly. And I mean, you know, we have video cameras that only have a very low processing speed in their digital um, processors and they can, they're still able to record 1080p. So, I mean, it seems like a lot of wasted power. Yeah, I guess, I guess if you want to do some video editing on your phone, you'd probably benefit from multiple cores. (laughs) That would be fun. (laughs) That would be fun. It might be a little bit frustrating. I mean, editing video on a desktop can be frustrating, so let alone on a phone. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so speaking of multiple core processors and software taking advantage of it or not taking advantage of it, Apple is reportedly doing something that's very, very smart. Uh, the iPhone 5, which is probably going to launch in September or so, is likely to have the A5 dual-core chip. And so what they're doing, apparently, is seeding developers with iPhone 4s with an upgraded chip so the developers can start working on apps to take advantage of two cores uh, because the, the operating system will be able to handle it, the, the, the hardware will be there. So Apple wants to launch the iPhone 5 with apps that can take advantage of two cores, which is such a great idea. 
Yes, it's very smart. Um, it seems. I hope that they change the form factor of the iPhone from the iPhone four to a, a different iPhone five. But it is smart to send developers a dual core uh, processing device because now they're able to create better games and all that great stuff. I don't know. Is it the iPhone four G S that they're sending them or something like that? Yeah, that's. I, I guess that's kind of what it's called. And and who knows? Maybe maybe the iPhone five will be called the iPhone four. It wouldn't be 4G. Well, that's true. 4, 4S. <laughs> 4S. They're really messing with these <laughs> names. Uh, I mean, it, it's very likely that the, the iPhone 5 is not going to be 4G capable, meaning LTE, or it'll probably do HSPA+, Plus, especially if it'll be on T-Mobile, which we're, we're hearing about today. You know it would be really cool is if they just sent all unlocked CDMA, GSM, everything. You know? That would be pretty cool. <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, if like they just sold unlocked devices that you could go to Apple, purchase, kind of like you do in Canada, you pick the carrier you want to use. You can either use Verizon, T-Mobile, or AT and T, and then you just do it like that. That'd be awesome if the uh, if the network technology was similar enough to allow you to do that. Yeah, that's what they do in Europe, <laughs> right? I mean, we were we were talking about this last time. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, it's great freedom to be able to buy a phone and then choose the carrier, but it's almost as if in the U.S. the carrier is the, uh, the, almost the primary motivating factor. I mean, you've got to get the right plan. You've got to get a service that you deem to be reliable and uh, g- good in your area rather than starting with the phone and then going to the carrier. Very much so. <laughs> Pretty cool. All right, well, let us move on. Uh, the next thing we're talking about, uh, in previous podcasts, we were sort of criticizing the Windows Phone 7 updates because, you know, Microsoft released this grid that said, um, you know, had February update listed and then March update. And it was like April and the February update hadn't been delivered to devices in the United States. But they, they seem to have catched up quite well. It looks like across the board, except for the HTC surround uh, the the Nodo update and the pre Nodo update have gone out. However, uh, AT and T sort of has tried to explain why uh, there was a delay with the with the Focus and with the Quantum and now with the Surround, which is that they added some enhancements, which I think is kind of silly. Uh, one allows you to automatically switch between AT and T hotspots when available. Yeah, that's that's great. And the next one will uh, allow support for the AT and T address book, which you know everyone uses. <laughs> you, what is the AT and T address book? Okay, I, I, if I can remember, I think it's a paid for service that's provided by AT and T that where they'll store your phone numbers. Um, but who would use that nowadays? I mean, we have Outlook, we have. You know, Google Contacts, so many services that are free that allow you to just save your contacts. I think it's for people that don't really know what's going on, um, y- y- if I that makes sense. It, it like, does. I mean, that's exactly... Like, they don't, know, they don't know that there's other options out there in order to save their contacts. Yeah. So, yeah. There, there are a lot of people, like, you know, like my mom and my dad and your mom and your dad, who would pick up a phone like this and say, oh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about storing my contacts in the cloud so that they're always backed up. But look, there's a program right on my AT&T phone that does that for me, and it's only, you know, $2 a month or whatever. I'm gonna yeah, do. exactly. <laughs> but um, uh, Speaking of parents, my mom is still using a flip phone. We've got to get her on Android or Windows phone or something. <laughs> something. Okay. What what do you think she'd be happy with? You know what? I got her a Nokia Surge a year or so ago and it was it was nice because the keyboard was huge, but uh she's she's still having trouble, so she she'd rather use her flip phone. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. We're talking about phones that Dan's mother might like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, we can move on. Well, actually, no, this is kind of a, a cool topic of conversation because I think a lot of people, you know, that are listening are are probably youngish, there might be some, you know, older folks listening, and we're happy to have them, where their parents are still using flip phones, feature phones. They haven't yet converted to smartphones because they say, you know, why do I need, you know, why do I need to pay extra for a data plan? Why do I need to check my email? When I'm going out of the house, I don't care if I, you know, get an email from from work. 
Um, my dad actually got a smartphone for the first time in uh, in the summer with the iPhone 4. And naturally, as predicted, he loves it. I mean, he checks flight times on the way to the airport. He checks his, his bank uh, when he's, you know, th- when he's thinking about it, not near a computer. Uh, but my mom, nah, she's... Uh, She's still in love with her uh, her flip phone. <laughs> nice. I, Let's see. I uh, I don't I don't even know what my dad's using these days. I think he just switched to Verizon. Um, most likely, it's not a flip phone. I know that um, a lot of his friends use Android, so I don't know why he doesn't get on the bandwagon. <laughs> Maybe he's a nonconformist. <laughs> he's kind of he's kind of computer illiterate. <laughs> oh, maybe he's computer illiterate. Maybe he just yes. He just won't understand. Speaking of flip phones, it's been a really really long time since we've seen a smartphone flip phone. I think the last one, you know, recently was the BlackBerry. What was it? The the, the I can't yeah, remember the name. The Smart Flip, right? Yeah, something like that. And before that, you got to go back to the HTC Star Trek. Remember that? Oh, I have one. It's, it's a pretty sweet device. <laughs> Just because, um, you know, it, it, was, it was powerful for a flip phone. Yeah, it, what would it run? Windows? It was uh, Windows, I think it was 5 that it came with. Of course, you know, changed that to 6.5 or 6.1 or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> I think they upgraded to 6.1. Um, that phone, you know, Adam had one, I had one. That was a really cool phone. I mean, it was really, uh, it, it didn't have a touch screen. It was kind of slow, and you couldn't do much with it. You couldn't really browse the web very well. But it, it, was, it, was, it was a revelation to be able to have smartphone capability in this familiar, comfortable flip phone form factor. So it was a pretty nice phone. I don't know why uh, HTC decided to not go to flip phones. Of course, now we all have slates, so... Uh, apparently they were right. <laughs> Why do you think HTC canned the flip phone? I think it was probably more design trends. People were probably fed up with the flip phones, although flip phones design was, was great because you wouldn't accidentally dial someone like you, like you do today. I mean, yesterday I, I even accidentally dialed someone on my iPhone. and mm. so. <laughs> Did you have a capacitive stylus in your pocket? Okay, I'm such a nerd, but yes, I did. <laughs> no way. That's how like you accidentally called someone? I don't think that's how it happened, oh. but um, <laughs> I did have a capacitive stylus in my pocket because uh, if I'm at work, <laughs> I can pretend that I'm writing on paper with my stylus and uh, use my phone. I'm a bad guy. <laughs> Man. What can I say? I hope uh, no, one's, no one from work is listening to these tricks that... <laughs> I hope not. (laughs) The reason, I mean, at the end of the day, if you want to know why a company doesn't make a product, it's because they don't think it's going to sell. I mean, obviously, they're in a for-profit business. And I think this is one place where OEMs are wrong. I think a flip phone would sell despite it having to have a smaller screen. I mean, the the screen on the Star Trek or whatever was about 2.5 inches. It was microscopic compared to the monsters of today. And uh, there's... There are still people out there that want a flip phone. I don't know. I think we should do a petition, and if, if anyone listening is, you know, it feels the same way about the flip phone form factor and wants it back, leave a comment, and maybe we can uh, maybe let, let our, our voices be heard or, or something like that. <laughs> um, you do a poll. <laughs> we could do a poll. In fact, we shall do a poll. I'm going to write that down. And another we weren't supposed to talk about flip phones but one more thing that i really like about flip phones is that you've always got a dialer pad so you open up the phone and you start dialing to make a call it's not you know go into the phone application go into your favorite list or go into contacts hold down the android button to bring up the keyboard so you can type the name of someone you're trying to call all right. Well, let's get back to our scheduled program, and we'll do a we'll do a poll about flip phones because uh, speaking okay. Speaking of dialers, why are we still having to dial the entire number or search for a contact? Why cannot every single smartphone just you know automatically start finding who we're searching for? You know, just by dialing the first few digits of the phone number or their name. Uh, I, it's I, one of the biggest things that I don't like about some smartphones is that. You're you're a hundred percent right. I 
uh, the Echo doesn't do it. HTC devices do it. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar, we're talking about smart dial. So if you're trying to call Bob, you don't have to uh, go into contact. You just type, you know, you look at the little letters under the numbers and you type that way. And maybe, maybe it's an intellectual property issue. Mm. Mm. But, you know, stock Android doesn't do it. So uh, maybe it's an HTC thing. C can you think of another... I mean, the iPhone doesn't do it even. So no, it doesn't. Maybe HTC has the patent on smart dial. Windows Phone 7 doesn't do it unless you have an HTC device. Oh, I, actually, I don't even think it does it if you have an HTC device. Hmm. Just because it's all, you know, locked down by Windows. That's huh. suspect. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> are there, are there third-party dialers you can get on, like, a Sony Ericsson device? For like an Xperia Arc, sure. Um, I'm sure there's something in the Android market. I haven't really looked that much. I've I've used something on iOS, but it was it was horrible, and uh, it was even a paid for app, and I was kind of upset that I paid for it. But um, perhaps there's stuff on the Android market. Maybe I should find something in a, a yeah, little let's, post. <laughs> let's let's both look, and if we find something, I mean, this will be very helpful to a lot of people who find it frustrating to not get smart dial in the dialer. Cool. Alrighty. So let us move on to the next thing. Um, so, uh, Dan, you have a focus, right? I do, yes. And it just updated. Uh, just did. Let's see, when did it update? I think it was last week on Tuesday, perhaps. Uh, maybe I'm off. Yeah, I think, well, I updated it on Tuesday because that was the last time that I used that phone. And is it everything you hoped it would be? Um, you know what, there really hasn't been much change other than the, the market and the copy and paste, but I guess there was other features that were added to the AT&T devices. Um, I, I never use hotspots. I always leave things on 3G Yeah. or, you know, just use Wi-Fi at my house. I've, I don't think I've, I think the only time I've ever used a hotspot for AT&T was at a McDonald's in a parking lot just because... I wanted to see what it worked, how it, how it worked, just to do a speed test. How did it work? It was okay. I mean, it wasn't the fastest. I mean, my, I think my 3G was even faster than the than the AT&T hotspot. So. Well, you got to go inside the McDonald's, get some fries, <laughs> sit down, and then you'll get faster speeds. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, this Noto update was rather minor. It, it basically brought forth features that should have been there from the beginning. And we're, we're hearing more and more ma about Mango, and we talked about Mango last podcast, but this last week we made a post, which was actually one of our most commented on uh, posts in Pocket Now history, talking about nine missing features from Mango. And I'll just call out a couple of them, and then I, I want to read a couple of comments uh, that, that some of our readers wrote in about. Um, so... Mango, as far as we know, by the way, these things might happen. This is just what we've heard so far. No Wi-Fi and USB tethering, uh, no screen capture, no flash support in the browser, no support for front-facing camera and video chat, no turn-by-turn text-to-speech navigation with offline support, uh, no third-party keyboard support, no landscape support for the start screen, no sharing options for video, and no smart dial. Um, yeah. <laughs> so... I think the the biggest ones of all of these would probably be the Wi-Fi and USB tethering because almost every smartphone that comes out on every other carrier is you know allowing users to access these these features so that they can connect their other devices like uh, their let's say their kid is in the back seat with a PSP or something and they they want to go onto the PlayStation Network well here you can just access it on my on your phone you know on your PSP let me connect my phone or or someone needs to use their laptop really quickly. Well, here you go. You can use that if you don't have a connection somewhere. Right. Uh, another big thing for me is screen capture because if you, I don't know if you've noticed, but every photo that I've that I've gotten for the Win, uh, Windows Phone Seven app roundup has been offline or off of the Zoom Marketplace just because I can't capture anything from the device itself. So th they're kind of. Uh, stolen pictures if you could say um and i think for others the f the flash support although 
you know, Apple says that Flash is going away, but but Flash is a great thing to have. I mean, I think that's why people with Android devices love browsing the internet so much is because if you have Android 2.2 or higher, then, I mean, you get all that Flash support on the internet, and it's just like being on a computer. Yeah. So, so yeah. How, how important is Flash to you? You know what, I... It depends on what I'm going to be using it for. I use Flash um, pretty regularly. I've even installed the the Flash on my iPhone 4 just because I wanted to see how it worked, and it did not work as well as it does on the Android devices. Yeah. Let's see. Like so, you know, there's just so so many websites that use Flash. So. Yeah, and you know, it's just the current state of the web right now. But but certainly, I think the consensus from all sides except for Adobe, is that uh, <laughs> HTML5 is, is the future. So here are, here are a few comments. There's, there were a lot of comments for and against the, our article saying, you guys are crazy, uh, stop trying to be critical, and other people saying, yeah, you know, I totally agree with you. Here are some other features that Windows Phone 7 could have. So I'm just going to do a small sample here. Uh, this is from uh, Mikado Wu. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Being a new Windows Phone user, I freaking love this phone, and I'm so happy... Uh, at long last to drop my droid, here is what I would like to see added. Um, honestly, put in the musts. I don't understand what that's saying, but here, here it is. A must, or the musts. Uh, more bulk stuff. Bulk SMS, pictures, video, and so on, so you could do more actions at one time. Custom ringtones, which actually will be in Mago, by the way. A uh, full Zoom experience. Create playlists and smart DJ. Um, Zoom has a lot of really cool features. The Zoom HD that Windows Phone 7 doesn't have. So I understand that. And, of course, he brings up smart dialing. Um, here are some good ones, things that his phone needs. HDMI output, Windows Phone 7 doesn't support it. Um, this is kind of OEM specific. USB on the bottom, what's with this side crap messes up my dock in my car that I made. No need for ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What do you think, Dan? Uh, USB port on the bottom or the side? Uh, I would probably say the bottom. The Focus has one on the top, and it's uh, it's rather annoying. Uh, yeah, the, so, yeah, the top is thumbs down for that. I mean, I guess it matters what you're doing with your phone. I've heard the, the argument about the, the car dock. Adam uh, ha, ha also made a car dock, and he puts the, the jack in the bottom, which makes a lot of sense. So the the one on the side's kind of weird. It looks like HDC is going towards side, so people are going to have to get used to that. Um, finishing up this comment, he said, Things that can wait, front-facing camera. We are two years away from this being really mainstream. Cool to have, but not needed yet. Uh, Tether, he said, Okay, this could be nice. However, I've rarely not been around an access point, and when I'm not, I should not be on the net anyway. That's a good point. <laughs> um... Here's a, here's a really good list from Philip Jones, and then we're going to move on to the next topic. Um, let's see here. Ability to save location in Bing Maps, better camera settings, and have the ability to take photos with a touch of a button or have a timer to lower camera shake. That's a good one. Um, this is interesting. The Office software is worse than on Windows Mobile 6.5. Why? Uh, what do you think about Office on Windows Phone 7, Dan? Um, I've only used it a few times. Uh, it's okay if you're going to open up documents. To create new documents, it's kind of a pain. Uh, I couldn't see anyone ever using it to create a PowerPoint document. But to create a Word document really quickly, if you just need to type something up, it works pretty good. Uh, it's nice to be able to change some of the fonts. And, uh, let me see. Can you change the fonts? I think you can. You can, yeah. Yeah, you can change the fonts and you can uh, increase the size and stuff. But... Uh, other than that, I couldn't, I couldn't see anyone you know, creating a super rich PowerPoint presentation on their Windows Phone 7 device. And I, I, don't, think, I don't think that's what anyone wants to do, nor what Microsoft <laughs> has intended. Um, exactly. But, but I don't think it's worse. I think it's pretty similar to what it was before. Plus, um, you know, they, they have a pretty robust commenting engine built into it, which is handy when you're collaborating with people. I mean, it is a lot better now that you can copy and paste. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so here are some others. Make the keyboard widen, wider when typing in landscape. Uh, I believe you get a 
a menu item on the right when you're in landscape and typing, and then there's a black bar on the left. Um, so that makes sense. Support for dual-core processors. I think that Microsoft could potentially beat Android to this, beat Google to this, uh, because Android, of course, doesn't support multiple cores right now. Honeycomb probably does. Let's see, and a couple more DLNA and Bluetooth 3.0 support. Those might be on the hardware level. A file explorer with the ability to transfer files via Bluetooth. We're never going to see a file explorer in Windows Phone 7. It's very anti what they're trying to do. Um, and native micro as a D support, yeah, I, I agree with that. Do you remember the whole fiasco, Dan, with the micro SD? You know, the Focus ha- happened to have a external micro SD port, but you had to be careful with it. Uh, yes, and I used a card that was not that great. I think it was like a class two and it was 16 giga, gigabytes and the phone would freeze constantly. So I had to switch back to a higher class of a eight gigabyte card just because the other card, I don't know if it was a, a failure in the card itself or what was going on, but it, it really does matter which kind of card you use just because uh, the focus was able to, you know, you could switch the cards out and a lot of the other devices you can't, but I think that they should allow people, if they want, to upgrade the memory. I think that would be intelligent on their part just because, I mean, if rumors are true, the iPhone 5 or 4G or 4S or whatever will have like 64 gigabytes of memory. And, you know, a lot of other devices are able to use a 32. And when they come out with the newer technology, I think it will be able to go up to 128 gigabytes on a on an SD card. If that, That's amazing. Yeah, and it's also a big cost savings for the OEM to have the option to put in a diminutive amount of memory on the phone. Like on the Kiosk Sarah Echo, there's like 500 megabytes of storage. But, I mean, who who really cares what's inside on the device if you can, if the device can come with a storage card, that's that's the best case scenario. Or if you can go and buy a cheap, you know, 8, 16, 32 gigabyte micro SD card, I mean... It's a it's very necessary nowadays, given how costs are, to have a have an external micro SD slot. I agree. Yes. Very good. Let us move on to. <laughs> I don't know what kind of accent. Uh, let's move on to our next story. Um, the Sony Xperia, Sony Ericsson Xperia Arc, uh, which is, which you reviewed, right, Dan? Yes. Awesome device. Awesome device. Was, it was a really great smartphone. Other than it being made mostly out of plastic, it was nice and thin. It felt good in hand. It took phenomenal photos. I couldn't believe how great the photo quality was in both video and uh, just regular, you know, still photos. Hmm. So you must be excited that it's uh, coming to the U.S. Yes, and I do appreciate that Sony Ericsson is going to, you know, unlock the bootloader so that you'll be able to access things that most you know, most Androids aren't able to do just because uh, they're so locked down. Yeah. Yeah, that is very, what's the word? Um, It doesn't seem very open source like Google wanted the Android operating system to be. I mean, if that makes sense. Yeah. The whole purpose of it was to be open source. So, I mean, if they keep things locked down, then it's not really too open to everyone. So, Well, I think that part is just up to the OEM. Google really can't control that I mean they I'm sure that Google wants the uh, all of these har- pieces of hardware to come with unlocked bootloaders but the the OEMs don't want to get calls to their support line constantly saying oh I bricked my phone because I installed something <laughs> and made it explode <laughs> nice <laughs> um, it, also this, the screen on the Xperia Arc was really really clear um, you couldn't you couldn't see it in video, but watching watching videos on the device, I mean, it was like watching them on an HD TV, just because it was so clear and the transitions from frame to frame was just so smooth. I, I mean, I can't even explain how how clear the device was just because mm. of the mobile Bravia engine. So you think that made a big difference? I think it did. Um, I believe that it turns on when you're doing a graphic. Uh, rich media and stuff like that. So, and it would turn off if you're just using the home screen or something like that. It it must because 
uh, when I was at CES and I did a hands-on of this, I basically went into the settings, it was off, and I flipped it on, and I said, nothing's changed, this is stupid, but... <laughs> But it sounds like I, sh- I sort of shortchanged the arc and that the Bravia magic happens when you're actually doing something that would take advantage of it. Yeah. Another cool thing that Sony Ericsson incorporated into this device is you are able to connect it dir- because it does have an, a mi- uh, micro HDMI port on it. You can connect it directly to a Bravia television and it will even turn the TV on. I have a Bravia TV and unfortunately I didn't have a cable. I wanted to try it out, mm-hmm. but I didn't have a micro HDMI cable. So uh, I did see videos online showing that it was able to turn the TV on and, you know, show exactly what was on the screen on the large screen. So that was great. If you want to share things, I don't know how practical that would be to a lot of people, but uh, it was nice to have the option. (laughs) So, So it will turn on your TV just by plugging your phone into it? Yes. If you have a Bravia powered television, it'll turn the TV on. Well, what are the other advantages? Well, it was great because you could show the entire. It would uh, it would convert. I think it would change it to also portrait and landscape, depending on which way this the phone was, and you could share videos and stuff like that. Huh. So I don't know how many people would use that. I guess if you were going over to Grandma's house and she had just gone over, just gone to Hawaii and wanted to show you her slideshow, then uh, there you go. Grandma has a old <laughs> tube TV with bunny ears. I don't think nice. she, this, is, this isn't going to happen here. <laughs> nice. Um, anyway, so yeah, so the Arc's <laughs> coming to the U.S., which is great. It's a great phone. It's thin. Um, this summer, on a GSM carrier, so there are only two choices for that. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on. Apple is suing Samsung, and... Uh, it's over a lot of things, but uh, most notably and most understandably is the the appearance of not only the the the, the Galaxy S and the whole Galaxy S line of devices, the Fascinate, the um, what are the other ones? There's like fifteen. The Epic, the uh, Captivate, and the Fascinate. Did I ever say that? Sorry, I said that. Um, and and the icons, just how the the icons look next to each other. And it's funny, Business Week did an article showing side by side, you know, the iPhoto application with the Samsung photo application, the settings icon with the, um, the settings icon on the other thing. And they are so similar. I understand why this lawsuit is happening. That's exactly what I thought when I got the Galaxy S a year ago. I was like, wow, this is a 3GS. And the iPhone 4 just came out. I was like, are they going to copy the iPhone 4? And Apparently, they thought that was a good idea to also. But the weird thing is, like, why would Apple be suing them when they were the manufacturers of their processors before? So, I mean, I don't know. It all depends on who wants money, I guess. But, yes, I agree. They do look very similar to one another. I mean, even even the – you're right. Even the apps look like iOS apps. I mean, they're just the same shape, the uh, rounded corner square, and – I mean, it it looks very similar. Do you know Apple has trademarked the uh, daisy flower representing their photos application? They trademarked a flower? <laughs> yeah, they did. Um, they, I did not know that. They really, uh, among many, many, many other things. Uh, so, so if you look at the, the Galaxy S photo application there's a flower in the background and Mm -hmm. so i mean why couldn't they put a dog or not a a sky or sunshine or something (laughs) or a smiley face i mean maybe someone has a smiley face trademarked already walmart perhaps (laughs) well uh yeah perhaps (laughs) um but you know fortunately uh well i guess it doesn't really matter to the average consumer because this is probably going to draw on for years and years but the new version of TouchWiz coming to the Galaxy S2 is very different than iPhone. They've redone it quite substantially. Well, that's a very intelligent move on their part so they don't get sued again. But we'll see. The, I, if, if I can remember, the form factor looked really similar to the iPhone 4. I mean, it was, it was a, you know, kind of like a square device. Yeah. With the flat, with the flat edges. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's hard to avoid that iPhone look. I mean, it's <laughs> you're right. I mean, I'm looking at it now. It does. It looks like the original Galaxy S, which looked like the iPhone 3GS. But what what are they going to make a triangular phone here? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, I don't know. It's it's weird on Apple's part that they should be so offended that people would want to be similar to their devices. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, I guess the the question at the end of the day is, has Samsung's actions to make their product appear to be like an iPhone been detrimental to iPhone sales? Does someone go into a uh, you know a Verizon store and see the Fastinate that and see the interface which kind of looks like an iPhone and says, hey, you know, I can't I can't uh, get the iPhone. It's it's much more expensive, but this Fastinate is hundred dollars less and it looks like an iPhone, so I'm going to get it and forget the iPhone. Yeah, um, I doubt it. I think if someone's going to get an iPhone, they're going to get an iPhone. Uh, I've had friends that actually had a Fascinate, and they went and got the new iPhone for Verizon uh-huh. just because they wanted to use it. And I was like, I was like, that's cool. I mean, the apps are great for iOS, of course. But uh, but yeah, I don't think people would confuse the two. I think I think if they try one out and they like one, they're going to choose that one opposed to the other. So. I don't think I don't think they would be confused by the the form factor or the applications on each or the, you know the platform on each. Yeah, good point. Well, we'll see what happens with that. As you implied, uh, Apple and Samsung have a, a tight relationship. They provide, you know, Samsung provides formerly formerly processors, and I think the solid state memory comes from Samsung, right? I think so, if I can uh, remember correctly. So it seems weird that you know with a partnership that you would want to sue them. That would be like, you know, if, if, if I was to sue you, which would be really stupid. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> like, if, if you're going to sue, like, one of your friends, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You no? Know? That's a good point. Yeah. We'll see what happens with that. Uh, let's <laughs> move on to more iPhone stuff. So, we, we saw this video uh, around 19th of April showing off what might be iOS 5.0. And the, the, the folders looked a little bit different, but what was most striking is that when you double tap on the home button, you're taken to a zoomed out card-like view that gives you a preview of the open applications. Um, I guess the question here is, is this, is this iOS 5? Is this something Apple would do? You know, I think that's a jailbreak option. Um, I've heard that you can get that just by jailbreaking your device and then uh, using Cydia to find that. Hmm. That's disappointing. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think it was like a Vietnamese um, video that came out of a white iPhone with the iOS five, but um, the setting said iOS five, so we'll have to see. Yeah, we should find that if you can find that uh, that city. Yeah, I'll look. Let's see. Uh, so uh, we'll see. Yeah, but um, I mean, it's it's kind of a cool idea. Uh, Right now, you double tap and you see icons. It would be probably a little bit more intuitive if you were to see a little live preview of what the app, the contents of the app. Could be neat. All righty. Let's just move on. Just a couple of more things to talk about here. Um, So we've been talking about how uh, the iPhone is probably not going to come out in time for its typical release cycle, June, July. And Reuters has come out to say that it's actually shipping in September. Reuters is a very, uh, uh, you know, accurate source. And so you can, you can, you can take that to, to mean what you will. But it makes sense because there's also rumors that the iPad 3 is coming out as soon as September. And they're doing this to align the release dates of their their products. I mean, the, the new iPods always come out in, in September, October, in time for the holiday season. And why not all of their products? So they can, you know, stop doing this, this you know, April for an iPad and June and July for the iPhone. Um, I guess there's not much else to say about that. Yeah, um, other than people might not want to shell out thousands, thousands of dollars in, in one month when over months, they could uh, they could do that. You know, let's see what kind. Con- so the iPad comes out in April, and then you could get an iPhone in June, and then in, you know an iPod in 
September if you wanted to for a friend or something like that. But, so yeah, um, to have all of them come out at the same time, I mean, it makes sense on their part just because I don't believe that the iPhone 5 is going to come out in June uh, just because we haven't seen anything. And in the past, we've always seen rumors, unless they're just keeping everything so tight, you know, just so tight that they're not having any people have any of their uh, prototype devices out there or anything like that. So after what happened last year, that will yes. that's probably yeah. what they're doing. Um, yep. So uh, you won't be finding an iPhone five in a bar this year. <laughs> that was that was an epic situation in the tech community. It really was amazing. Yeah, and it, you know, it didn't even look like it was going to be the iPhone 4. Like, you saw it and you were like, okay, is this a mock-up? Because it was just so different from the previous builds of the of the device. So, yeah. But it was nice. It was nice that it came out like that because uh, the iPhone 4 was was a pretty pretty sweet device. So, yeah, it is. It is. It was and it is. Um All right, let's move on. Final thing we want to talk about today. Remember the Samsung Infuse 4G, was, which was announced, I think, at CES. Remember that phone? Uh, yes. It was a big phone. I mean, it had, like, what, like a four-and-a-half-inch screen, and it was super AMOLED. And yeah, so the it big... Looked, it looked like a really great phone to have. So. Yeah, yeah. So, as you said, 4.5-inch screen, which is the biggest, the biggest, I guess you could say the Dell Streak was the biggest at five inches, but that was yeah, a tab. That was just so big like i couldn't see people using that as a phone it would be like if you were to use a galaxy tab as a phone so <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny site yeah i don't think anyone used a streak as a, as a phone maybe a, a, just a few people but um the infuse 4g has that large super amoled the biggest super amoled screen in fact i think it's the super amoled plus which oh, would make it well even better <laughs> Yeah, this thing's going to be a monster. 1.2 gigahertz. It's basically the Galaxy S2, but on AT&T with their non-existent HSPA Plus network plus a bigger screen. Uh, yeah, what's up with that? Why is AT- why did AT&T release devices when their network wasn't able to, you know, cover it? So, I don't know. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> you- I know I know that you've had a, a 4G device on AT&T and have not yet seen any HSPA Plus Network speed. Is that true? Yeah. What about you over in Washington? Have you... you know, I haven't used a 4G device on AT&T just, um, just because I've heard that you know, it's not available. I mean, it could be in the metropolis of Seattle, but I don't think it's out here where I live. I live um, in Lake Taps, so it's a little bit south of Seattle. I think it exists in a cave in Arizona somewhere. <laughs> there's, there's one tower that is underground almost and if you crawl into this hole and it's hard to get in there because the size is kind of small so you have to um, maybe lose a few pounds before going in this hole but once you get in there you get crazy HSBA plus speeds on AT&T nice <laughs> then you could just go over to Verizon and use their LTE uh, yeah you could um, <laughs> but at the same time um, these uh, you know, the Atrix and the Inspire and I think the Infuse are very thin devices, uh, which make them a little bit more compelling than, say, Verizon, where the Thunderbolt and the the, the LG Revolution and the upcoming Droid uh, Stealth are pretty thick because they have the CDMA modem plus the uh, the LTE modem, two separately, two totally separate components, whereas these AT&T phones have the, you know, the same sort of modem plus... Uh, the, I, I'm not even sure if there's much more hardware needed beyond that. Um, probably not. It's probably just the processor does everything. Um, they don't need a separate a separate chip like they do in the 4G devices on um, uh, Sprint and Verizon. So there's got to be some modification because if it was just a matter of the the the, the uh, you know existing internals, though they would be able to flip on HSPA Plus for. Uh, you know, like the Captivate, for example, but there's some hardware that's got to be involved. But we are not, uh, we're not electrical engineers, so. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to even call HSP plus 4Gs, but so, so there you go. <laughs> I don't know, Dan, I don't know if I agree. <laughs> I mean, HSPA plus in, 
optimal conditions, especially if you've got like a T-Mobile G2X, can do wicked fast speeds. I mean, they could rival where LTE is today. Yes, but the term 4G is, you know, fourth generation technology, and they're only using like 3.5G, if you think about it, because, you know, in Europe, they have the HSPA Plus Networks, but they've they've had them for a while, and uh, it was just they could just call it three point five. So I don't know. Yeah, from a technical standpoint, I agree. I agree with you. But as a consumer, um, if I pull out a Thunderbolt, I can get ten megabits per second down. If I pull out a G two X or a, another, maybe the My Touch four G, I can get around there. Sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. So to me, I. I, you know, I guess I'm fooling myself. I really don't care what it's called. It's getting these incredible fast speeds. <laughs> that does make perfect sense. It shouldn't be what it's called. It should be based upon the speed that you're getting. And unfortunately, we're not getting those speeds from AT&T anymore. There's so. going to be one podcast where we don't talk about this. Okay. <laughs> we could edit this part out if you want. <laughs> um, actually, today I ran a speed test <laughs> Here we go again. I ran a yeah. speed test on my uh, on on the Inspire 4G. I got a pretty good three megabits per second down, which is about as fast as you can go around here with HSDPA. And then I did the upload test, and again it was like 600. And then I went into about network, and I I always do this. I check it because it'll tell you if you're on the HSPA Plus network. And I was on HSDPA, so hmm. boo hoo. See, maybe they maybe they do have HSPA Plus in my network because on my iPhone I get, you know, five megabits per second speed. So I don't know. Well, your iPhone, the iPhone isn't capable, but it has it has the uh, the HSUPA unlocked, unlike other devices. So I think what you're experiencing is just a really fast HSDPA. I mean, the theoretical maximum is ex- pretty. Or you practical maximum is what you're describing around four or five. Yeah. Well, oh, uh, it's definitely not four G. I know that, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Well, uh, that will conclude our, our our podcast, Dan. It was really great having you. I think we uh, we had a lot of fun here, and it's good to have you on. Thank you very much. I appreciated it, and it was a blast. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the podcast, and we'll talk to you uh, or see you, or you'll hear us next week. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.